Today, I would like to help you make a decision if I can, whether you should buy a small mill or a standard size industrial mill like a Bridgeport or a Bridgeport copy, something like that. The dilemma that I ran into and the feedback I got from people that I talked to when I was looking to buy a small mill was why would you spend the same amount of money or more on a small mill when you could get a standard industrial size machine like a Bridgeport for the same cost and sometimes less. Why would you do that? Well, that's what I want to talk to you about today. Sort of in a way share with you what my experience was going through that and why I ultimately did decide to continue with the path of buying a small machine first. Maybe you are in the process of deciding which machine to buy or you're thinking about it and starting to get into machining and metalworking and the idea of having a machine in your garage has dawned upon on you, hopefully this will be helpful. It's kind of an overview of the thought process and the learning that I went through in buying several of these small mills that we have in the shop today. So I don't want to make this a review of this machine in particular, but I do want to talk about larger machine shops might think that these machines are kind of a joke or a toy or for, you know, hobby use only. I disagree with that. They're fully capable of doing industrial production work if set up properly. I think they have a lot of value, especially for engineers, people that want to develop products themselves or build things at home. Really a, a gateway product to get people into machining and make it accessible for them to do in their own home. If you're looking at milling machines, you're probably familiar with the Bridgeport mills, probably most famous uh, manual knee mill available. And there's been hundreds of different companies copy them. One thing that is a little bit rare or hard to find is a smaller knee mill or smaller Bridgeport type machine. There's a few companies that make what they call like a half size Bridgeport. The one that comes to mind is made by Jet. A little expensive for the size, but that tends to be normal for the smaller mills. You, you're paying more for convenience and portability. It could also be a benchtop milling machine that you're looking at. It doesn't have to be a knee style and maybe not quite this big, but a bench top mill like this guy over here is also another option and very popular and available in three and four axis CNC options as well. It's kind of for a specific crowd. These machines are really made for home engineers, hobbyists, people with limited space, limited budget, people that are unsure about their long-term plans, whether they are going to be living in the same place for a long time, whether they are really going to like doing metalworking at home and it's going to be become a large active hobby or business for them. Those decisions are kind of what a lot of people are figuring out when they buy something like this. People want to be able to get their feet wet in milling, but may not be ready to jump into a huge machine that they have to pay money and stress and time in to get rid of it if they ever change their mind or move. I hear the term boat anchor a lot. Many people don't want the mental weight of a machine. They can only move by forklift instead of with their own hands. Being stuck with that in a way, even if they don't plan on moving or having to sell the machine, for some people it's a emotional weight that they drag around with them. I personally have moved seven times in the last 10 years. They were all positive moves and for good reasons. Luckily I didn't move the shop that many times. Buying equipment can be as stressful as it is fun and people who don't want to move a 2,000 plus pound machine may find something like this, which is a thousand pounds, acceptable. You can move it with your own car, or with a trailer, with a truck. This one, the small ones, are something you can put on wheels too. So it can be portable and easily rolled around. As far as capacity, a lot of the machines are pretty good quality. This particular machine is the Grizzly G0695. A machine this size, in good shape, shape has close to the same milling capacity as a Bridgeport size mill. The head on this machine is very nice. You have the Bridgeport style head, but it's just a V-belt on the inside from the motor to the spindle. There's no variable speed in here and there's no pulleys to change to change the speed that you're running. This has a digital spindle control on it with a VFD controlling the motor. You have a regular emergency stop switch switch, power on switch for the DRO, and then you get to control the direction of the spindle and how fast you want it to go. 
So if we choose clockwise for standard milling direction, you can turn the dial here and the spindle will turn for you. And you get to choose the RPM. This machine will go all the way from 10 to 2,250 RPM. Even at the low RPMs, it does have very good torque. Just to show you an example here, it's still running at eight RPM, you can see down here. So you have very good control, especially with a machine like this. I can't stop it with my hand, so it still has a lot of torque even at that speed. For small tools and engineering work, you're gonna be able to do some pretty intricate, delicate stuff if you need to. And like I said, it will go all the way up to 2250. It will spool up with your hot dial. It's very smooth. Some of the Bridgeport style features that this machine and a lot of the knee mills, small knee mills are missing is the power feed in the head. It has a feed that you can engage. So this is your hand feed for the quill for boring, for example. You will screw in this knob in the back to engage it, and then you can crank the quill down with the knob. So it's a manual control, great for boring and doing operations precise uh, diameters like that, but it is manual and you choose the speed and you have to crank it all the way. Not a big deal for most operations you're gonna do. Another thing, it doesn't have a high and low gearbox, so you've got one belt in here and you've got the VFD here and that's all you get. So you may not be doing a lot of uh, low RPM, very high torque cutting. There's no spindle lock or brake on this machine. When you turn the VFD down, it breaks the motor for you. But it also means you don't have a spindle lock. They put flats on the spindle here and you can put a wrench on there if you need to. For this particular setup, this machine was a standard manual drawbar and we added the Torquerite tool changer. Very reliable, even on a machine this size, it doesn't have any impact on the precision. Ultimately, it was the digital head on this machine that made me decide to buy this one. It is so convenient and fast and easy to be able to set your direction and turn the pot and have the machine go. Honestly, have never enjoyed changing the belt positions on a bridge port. I would never buy one that had the V-belt design. I would get the adjustable head speed. Another thing we did add to this is the DRO. We put glass scales on it. So between the DRO and the digital head, it's a pretty capable, convenient, nice to use machine. One other thing I wanted to mention is vices. I would recommend getting a quality vise. I like the Kurt vices. They used to make four inch, now they have five and six inch still and larger eight inch. Get a Kurt vise or a quality vise, even if you buy a used one. It's gonna make such a difference in how the part feels when you're cutting it and how well it holds it. I've been through lots of different Chinese vices. They served us well, we used them for thousands of parts. But when you upgrade even to a used Kurt vise, you're gonna feel the difference and it's gonna make your setups easier. I would highly recommend choosing a machine that has probably R8 tooling like this one. If it's not R8, probably the next most popular one is gonna be Morris Taper or something like that. Morris Taper 3 would be another option that has a lot of tooling that's affordable these days. You could use the excuse that buying a smaller machine is gonna require smaller tooling, which is gonna be cheaper, but I don't think that's a good excuse. The pricing is not gonna be that different, and then when you do upgrade to another machine, you're going to be buying bigger, different tooling anyway. So there's that. Other thought on CNC, if you're buying a machine that's not CNC and considering converting it, that can be a very good option, but you have to understand that that's a pretty serious project that you're getting yourself into. If you are not familiar with how mills work and you don't want to spend dozens or hundreds of hours learning about that and researching online and buying parts, and adjusting parts and making them fit, I would stay away from that. There's lots of kits available. We had considered making this one CNC. That was actually the plan, have it CNC and with the DRO, but we migrated on to bigger machines that were already fitted with controls and this one got left behind. So at this point, it's probably not worth it to do it. Maybe you can continue to use the R8 tooling. There's a, quite a few machines that are quite a bit larger than this that still use R8. So you could have several different generations of your machine buying evolution that uses the same tooling, which could be several thousands of dollars easily. 
with the knee mills, and that includes all of them, even the bridge ports, unless they're brand new and unless you have checked it and you know for yourself. Generally, the squareness of the knee to the saddle is not going to be perfect. Let's say you're cutting your part at one knee position, one Z height with your knee. If you have to then readjust the knee and go up or down in order to be able to finish cutting your part or change a tool. Once you move that knee, you have lost your true X and Y position. This is something that nobody really worries about with modern NC controlled machines because the head is adjusted square to the table within tenths. It's not an issue people have unless you have a really bad crash that you then have to repair. Once you move that knee, your X and Y zero reference position on your part has changed. Now it may not be very much on this machine. I think it's a couple thousandths over like six inches of knee travel. It's something you want to keep in mind. I've seen bridge ports where once you move the knee six or eight inches you're out ten thou in your position and that is something that either needs to be fixed or you just ideally for precise work you never move the knee on your setup if you can. If you're not familiar with knee mills, that is something to keep in mind. Looking at the price difference, you can buy this machine, for example, we bought new for like 4,000. It's like 5,000 today. I was just looking at it and the prices have gone up again. You could buy a used Bridgeport machine, very cheap one, maybe 2,000, pretty easily three, four, 5,000 for a used one. The drawback to those is a lot of them have been well used and a lot of them need repair. I think that's one of the main reasons that a lot of people shy away from them and would rather buy something smaller and new than a used bridge port because they don't want to deal with doing repairs on a machine that they're not familiar with, that they're not sure they're going to love before they even get to use it. And doing work on a bridge port is not the easiest thing a lot of the times. There's a lot of specific information about them. You have to be careful about some of the precise fits assemblies that need to be taken care of. You need to know what's worn and when, you know, things need to be replaced. Um, there's a lot to that. That's a whole profession in itself, really. So I'm hoping that this gives you a little bit of an overview of why you might still want to go down the road of a smaller machine instead of getting something big that you're not sure you're going to love or use that much. Mm -hmm.